Tonight, it's Australia's very own Amazon. But the Chinese want to rip it up and build a lake of acid waste. Which would rise 48 metres above my head. Charles Woolley joined Seven Spotlight for the most important story of his career. This one is closest to my heart. Can this Chinese company be stopped from destroying our national wonderland before it's too late? I would never be a Tasmanian living in a place where I thought we were doing something bad. Hello, I'm Michael Usher, and we begin tonight with the battle set to explode in northwest Tasmania. It centres around one of the most beautiful places on Earth, a place known as Australia's Amazon. This majestic treasure is under threat from a Chinese mine owner and the massive and toxic waste dam they're determined to build. And that threat is real, which is why one of our nation's greatest storytellers has returned to television. Here's Charles Woolley with the most evocative investigation of his career. On the wild west coast of Tasmania, this is the Tarkine. Half a million spectacular hectares of mountains and waterways enfolding ancient rainforests unchanged over vast reaches of time. To venture into this Tasmanian wilderness is to time travel back to the very beginning. A long time ago, when I was a kid, I first ventured into the wilderness, not with a television camera, but with a fishing rod. And I very soon learned that I actually wasn't here for trout. I was here for all of this, just for the sheer pleasure of being here. This kind of landscape that we see around us is temperate Tasmanian rainforest. It's vanishing all over the world. After all, there are eight billion people on the planet. There simply isn't room for it. But sadly, there are people and businesses that would destroy wilderness like this. And as a Tasmanian, I always ask myself, will the profits we get from exploiting the wilderness ever exceed the terrible loss we make when we destroy it? There is now an attempt to list the Tarkine as a World Heritage Site, because as things stand now, while it might look remote and safe, less than 10% of this area is wholly protected from logging or from mining. We're going to defend this forest to the last effort. When they can have their mine, we will have our forest. If you haven't heard of the Tarkine until now, Rest assured, you will. Well, this always makes me think of movies that have been made up in Amazon. I'm back in the wilderness with Dr. Bob Brown. I first met him as a journalist during the campaign to save the Franklin River. He won that round, but 40 years later, the fight has moved on to the Tarkine. I can tell you that I actually dreamed about this place as a kid. Growing up in Tasmania, we learned that over impenetrable mountains to the west was this amazing lost world, an unexplored wilderness of giant trees and mighty rivers, and that there lived here strange creatures, tigers and devils. And despite all the changes of the modern world, all that's happened, this place is timeless. It's still a place of tall tales and tall timber. This is in Australia, and most people don't know about it. I mean, to me, it's South America, perhaps New Zealand, New Guinea, but nobody knows it's here in Australia. It's one of the most beautiful places left on the planet. Yet here we are in the middle of it, and the pressure for mining, the pressure to log the forest is so great. We have to resist that because its greatest value is not for our pockets, mm. it's for our souls. I think 
The scenes we've seen over the last few days will delight Australians, but why should they care? Oh, Australians do care. The great majority of Australians want native forest logging stopped. The great majority want the Tarkine protected. They want these beautiful places to hand on to the next generation. There's just a tiny percentage of exploiters, and more and more these days, they're in Beijing or they're somewhere overseas making megabucks out of destroying places they have no relationship with. In the 1980s, Bob Brown was fighting a Tasmanian state-owned hydroelectricity generator. This time, he's up against a Chinese state-owned global mining company, MMG. This is a bigger business, which in 2021 recorded a revenue of $6.3 billion. This is the site of MMG's Great Wall of China in the Tarkine. What the company proposed for this spot is a 140 hectare lake of toxic mining sludge. That's about 200 football fields. And in order to contain that, they will have to build a dam wall twice the size of this old giant behind me, which will mean that I would be standing now at the bottom of that lake of toxic sludge, which would rise 48 meters above my head. All of this in one of the most beautiful places on earth. Hello, mate. My name's Charlie. Is Steve Scott around? I know he doesn't want to appear in camera because he's not allowed to. But it's always the same old story. Um, Steve's not available today. No, I didn't think uh, so. I've made this pilgrimage many times before. Have a good day. No comment. Often proceeds filming a long walk to the closed gate. It's probably no surprise that the mining company won't talk to us. At the entrance of the mine, there are three flags. One is just the flag of MMG. The other flag is the flag of Australia. And in the middle, the flag of the real owners of the joint, the People's Republic of China. Now, given the frosty Cold War relationship that's developed between Australia and China, which of those flags do you think best represents the decision to chuck us off the site? The flag of Australia or the flag of China? What do you reckon? MMG bought the mine at Rosebury on the boundary of the Tarkine in 2009 to extract zinc and copper, strategic metals important in industries like aerospace and national defence. Today, the demand is greater, and so MMG needs to expand its operation. Why did Australia allow a Chinese Communist Party-controlled mining company in in the first place, given the Cold War circumstances that we find us? Well, that's 2008 or 2009, where everything was subjugated by serial Australian governments to this great god of trade. And, of course, China wanted what we had to export, and so governments got out of the way. But how do you convince people that you can save the Tarkine without being anti-mining? We're not trying to stop MMG's mine. We're just saying keep your mining operations on your side of the river. Don't dump your waste here into the Tarkine. In fact, records show that over the past five years, MMG's existing waste facility has leaked 18 times into the nearby river. But now, the mine says they've cleaned up their act. Bob Brown is not convinced. Federal government permits a new dam to be built. He says hundreds of hectares of rainforest, home to some of Australia's most endangered animals and most beautiful flora, will be at risk. What we can't believe them on, and we already know this, is their environmental assessment of the damage they're going to do. Look at these. They grow at about a metre a century. So what, these are 150 years old? Yes, hundreds of years old. So we're uh, still youngsters then, mate. That's right. What struck me walking through the place is not only do you look up and you're impressed with the canopy in the forest, but there's another mini forest underneath. 
Look at all the stuff here. I shouldn't do that, but look at that. What a beautiful thing. And that doesn't belong to a mining company. It doesn't belong to a logging company. It belongs to the people of Australia. If the Albanese government ticks off on flooding this place, this is going to be a vat of acid. You wouldn't put your finger into it, and nothing can live in it. I got my little tent packed. I got my little bag ready. They'll kill this forest, but they're going to have to get rid of a lot of us in the process. Well, this is our camp in the, in the rainforest, and these are uh, folk sitting up in the trees. How are you going up there, Lisa? I'm good, how are you? They're warriors, aren't they? They're warriors, uh, and warriors. They're worried about this forest, and they're holding the line against the bulldozers coming in and taking all that's behind it. Well, I'm a Tasmanian. I love this kind of place, but I don't know if I'm going up there. You're out there with the elements, we're up there in the rain and the wind, and I see this reaction from people all the time. People come out to the forest and they're just like, oh my God, I'm, I feel alive, I feel like I can breathe. Forests like this are becoming rarer and rarer across the world. There has to be much more recognition of the natural value of leaving these places alone rather than just seeing what we can extract from them. How long are you prepared to stay up there? I'm not going to stop, and we're not going anywhere. We're going to keep fighting until the very last tree. If you follow my advice and you come down to see the Tarkine for yourself, you're going to do a lot of driving. There's half a million hectares of it and hundreds of kilometres of very windy road. The other thing that'll take your time is that round every corner there's a photo of opportunity. I mean, look at that. Nature has overdone it in the Tarkine. Ancient forests, dramatic mountains, deep and mysterious rivers. And still, there is more. Hundreds of kilometers of beaches fringing an almost limitless ocean. They call this place the edge of the world. After this, there is nothing until Patagonia, 18,000 kilometers away. So the westerly winds that blow in this 41 degree latitude have traveled more than half the world to get here, missing out on Africa, touching no land at all, passing under Cape Town to deposit rain in the rainforest and for me to breathe in what is scientifically proven to be the cleanest air in the world. You'll know that if you come here and just breathe it in. It'll make you feel good. You know, this is basically the graveyard of the Tarkine. These logs have been coming down and being deposited onto the beach here for millions of years. So, I mean, we've come here in part to show the huge diversity of the Tarkine. Yeah. I mean, I think Tarkine, I think mighty rivers and huge trees, but got a bit of everything. And it, it does have a bit of everything, and the coast is just as an important part as the rainforest is. Is tourism the way to say it? Everyone that I bring here is absolutely blown away. We need to protect it. We need to preserve it for the next generation. The one thing we don't want to do is absolutely stuff it. Steve Scott around. Why are you talking to me now about this? Because I know initially you had reservations. When will we get a minister for the environment who's going to say, I'm going to fight for the environment. I'll fight it all the way to Cadman. Are you the minister for the environment or the minister against the environment? It's a great town. It was a greater one. This uh, controversy with the tailings dam, mm. could that close the mine down? Absolutely. If they haven't got anywhere to uh, store their tailings, 
I just have to shut them on. Simple as that. There has been one problem, is that the dam has leaked on a number of occasions. Yeah, I think that's under control. But do you think that a Chinese company really has local Tasmanian considerations at heart? They employ 500 Tasmanians, a lot of people live here, so that's probably the bottom line. One thing a lot of people must remember too, Charlie, was when this mine was put on the market, none of the local lads wanted to buy it. The Chinese finished up mine, so we've only got ourselves to blame. But the way the bush grows around here, it wouldn't take long for it just to reclaim the whole place, would it? No. Come back in 50 years and I'd never know that Kev had lived here. No, exactly right. Hey, you would not know. <laughs> you wouldn't know that anybody lived here. Well, I thought that was it with the mine. But overnight, they've had a change of heart. I got a call from a bloke called Steve Scott, who's the general manager of the operation, and he now wants to talk to me, which is a good thing, because you do always want to get both sides of the story. So let's see how it goes. So there's the portal, Charles. So that's the, yeah. that's the entrance into our Rosebury mine. From the height we stand out here, the mine goes in a northerly direction, which is out this way, but straight down about 1.5 kilometres, so quite deep. How many people are here right here now? Here at the moment, there'd be a couple of hundred, though. Well, you wouldn't know they were here, would you? No, that's right, but I'd give you the tip, though. There's a lot of busy men and women underneath us at the moment working hard. Why are you talking to me now about this? Because I know initially you had reservations. I, I think... Um, you know, there's a fairly strong voice out there against mining and how we coexist in, in Tasmania. Um, but it's important to have a voice on the mining side of things. Hanging over the whole thing is our relationship with China is frosty, to say the least. Beijing, I mean, how much do they really care about this place, other than the profit? There is a lot of conversation about the Chinese ownership and that sort of stuff, but we don't see external pressure and sort of geopolitical issues on a daily basis at Rosebury. Regardless of ownership, the bigger issue is the potential environmental threat posed by the acid waste contained in the company's tailings dam. The area we're talking about is about half a million hectares that we call the Tarkine. How much of that would be what we're arguing over? The, what others would call the Tarkine area in Tasmania is, let's say, it's the size of this table and a so tiny little a portion little, on the coin. Little portion. Yeah. Yeah. You need a tailings dam to store that tailings material. If you can't store that, then you, you can't operate. Bob Brown would say it's a death by a thousand cuts. Once you get one, you get another and another. Is that right? No, I don't think so. Mine sites, you know, they don't go forever. We just need it for the time we're here. Is my expectation ridiculous as a Tasmanian that I want to have my cake and eat it too? I want what you do, but I also want the wilderness yeah. to be preserved. I think that's what we all want, right? That, I think we've got to strike a balance between jobs and the economics of it, but also solar power and wind turbines, we contribute to that. As Steve Scott points out, the world urgently needs what are often called the critical metals mined here to enable the transition to alternative, cleaner energies like wind and solar power. I would never be a Tasmanian living in a place where I thought we were doing something bad. What do I see every day, though? I see 550 employees and contractors that come here 365 days a year to operate our, our little West Coast mine, and they do it, they do it bloody well. You can feel for the mine manager. He's caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. It's quite heavy. To be fair, whatever their nationality, mining companies always fear that the hard-headed pursuit of profit can never compete with a soft-hearted embrace of natural beauty. But hard environmental heads like Bob Brown see it differently. For them, the acid test is the acid waste. We've got to set a world lead here, and it's not hard to do. It's just whether we are so weak, so pathetic, so out of touch with our obligation to future generations that we just say, oh, yeah, go in there, dump your acid waste there. You could have done it elsewhere, but we want to be nice to you against the interests of our own country. And I think Australians are more and more appalled by that, and they want our government to arbitrate on behalf of the Tarkine. Now, what is it with Canberra that's something that the average European country, for example, would give its eye teeth to have this rainforest? 
when will we get a minister for the environment who's going to say, I'm going to fight for the environment. I'll fight it all the way to cabinet. After where I've just been, being back in the city is, well, it's a bit of a shock. 90% of Australians live like this in major cities, and it's where the decisions are taken about the future of our wild places. In the case of the Tarkine, that decision belongs to the Federal Minister for the Environment, Tanya Plibersek. She lives here in her federal electorate of Sydney, and yes, that is 1,500 kilometres, and indeed a whole world away from the Tarkine. Given our current frosty relationship with China, halting the progress of one of its mines is no doubt a sensitive issue. So we wrote to the minister and we rang, inviting her to speak to you on this program. She declined. Instead, we received this from a government spokesperson. The Australian government will make its own independent decision on whether this project should be approved or not. And of course, the question I would like to have asked Tanya Plebisek is a matter of simple definition. Are you the Minister for the Environment or the Minister against the Environment? So check out this beautiful big one here. Look at that thing there. Well, how many of us would it take to get round here? Ooh, I reckon probably a ten to a dozen of us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So any little seedling around my feet here is going to have to climb what, 500 years before it gets up to the light? Yes. I wonder if human beings will be around by then. I've spent 27 years as a tour guide in the Tarkine. This is something natural that people want to see. I've travelled to Indonesia where they're cutting and chopping down rainforests flat yeah. out. What's happening there is what you don't want to see here. Yeah, yeah, we, we will we, put a tailing we, staff in the Tarkine. And we're hypocrites. We're doing it right here, right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. incredible. Oh, what a heartbreak. For me, it would be just that, a heartbreak, to lose this wondrous place to logging and to mining. Of course we need resources, but we need this world as well. Having grown up in this kind of country, this will always be a place where the heart should rule the head. There is a reasonable point, isn't there? If we can't get it right in a rich first world country, how do we expect the third world to behave properly? We have no right to expect the Brazilians to protect the Amazon or the Indonesians to protect the orangutans if we don't protect this small, magnificent rainforest here in Australia. And this one is the most protectable. So it's up to Australia to protect it.